Good evening, everybody. Glad you all are here. Uh, I wanted all parents and kids to start in the sanctuary just so I could go ahead and get a head count, see how many kids we have. Uh, praise God that there are kids here and they're wanting to sing and, and be a part of the choir, uh, whether their parents made them or they actually want to be here. But <laughs> praise God that they are here. Um, I'm excited to see uh, them perform for us in about four weeks. Um, so they're going to go back. Uh, kids, you guys can go ahead and head to the fellowship hall now uh, with Miss Amelia. You can go ahead and follow her and Mr. Noah to the fellowship hall. Thank you guys so much. Good evening, church. It is good to see everybody. It's cold outside, huh? Yeah, I was uh, I was in Cleveland, and they go, oh, you, you brought all that North Carolina weather up here. It was like 88 degrees. I go, well, it's 100, you know, in North Carolina right now. So um, go ahead and open your Bibles. Let's worship together. Let's stand. Turn to 546. 546. Hymnal. Hymnal. Sorry, not your Bible. Did I say Bible? <laughs> Page you. Well, it all depends on what Bible you have, you know. We'll just sing from right there. Be like, why is everybody singing different words? All right. Let's see if I can find a good, comfortable key for all of you guys. Here we go. 546 Don as you're coming in the door. <laughs> Here we go. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessings, presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Verse 3. Souls in dangers look above, Jesus completely says. He will lift you by his love out of the angry ways. He's the master of the seas, billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so I'm just going to do a little hand raise. How many of you know that hymn? Okay. So just so you know, when I usually have Miss Pam here, I sing it about 50 times faster than that. But I wasn't sure if you guys knew it or not. So I just want you to know that's a Pastor Dave top five favorite. Amen. It's one of my favorite hymns. Why? Because his love lifted me. Amen. Amen. 
I um, was flying back last night, and I called my wife, and I said, honey, I said, pray for me. I, I've got an opportunity here. She goes, what do you mean? I said, well, if I stay on the flight I am on, it's a two-hour delay. She goes, oh, that's great. Why is that good news? I said, well, I'm standing at a gate right now that I'm on standby, and I was number two in line. I said, if I get on this, I said, I'm about to board in 15 minutes. I'll be home by 8 o'clock. And so I made it home by 8 o'clock. So that was a blessing. I gave God all the glory. I uh, got to spend some time um, in Cleveland, Ohio, and guys, it was hot there too. So, um, but uh, was watching texts from California. Of course, uh, Brother Jesse is still um, at the convention there. Um, representing our church, and um, of course, Dakota and Avery and myself are asking all types of questions and all types of things, and so just be rest assured that we are well represented, so uh, what a blessing that is. So just keep, continue to pray for him and his uh, beautiful wife, and of course, I think uh, Roman's with them as well, so just pray for them for traveling mercies as we move forward. So praise reports and prayer requests. I knew he was going to go first. How about? Amen. Thank you, Austin. I love it when he prays. And for those of you who didn't know, he was nonverbal up until he was seven years old, so now he talks all the time, which is great. What do I think of that new baby? He's a pretty chill guy. Yeah, he is. I think uh, my wife and I are are like... Wow, because um, I don't think we, we didn't have one like that. <laughs> uh, Avery was a stinker, and I mean that in a, a loving way. I, pastor Avery was a stinker. Yeah, you know, he was. He wasn't always a pastor, just so you know that. You know, he could be a bad kid too, right? Becky, you taught him, right? Was he naughty in high school? <laughs> but no, uh, he is a beautiful uh, young man. His skin is... Um, I'm jealous. He's got really nice skin for a guy. So I'm like, I'm like Gus, you know, God, you know, where'd you get that skin from, you know? So, but yes, uh, he is, um, he is a joy. And those of you, do we have grandparents in here, by the way? Do you agree with me though? Aren't aren't grandkids wonderful payback? Mm. You know, I'm like sitting there going, especially as you know, my daughter's with us now, just joined the church or back with the church, and. When I see the kids act up, I go, <laughs> payback, you know, <laughs> you acted just like that. So, so I can't wait to do that to Avery because uh, I think an hour old, he was literally lifting his head up. He had just been bored, was already lifting his head, and mama couldn't sleep, and he was literally rolling off of Debbie. So she goes, here, you take him, you know, <laughs> let her get some sleep, so, but... God is good, and all the time, and we serve a greater high priest. If you didn't get that on Sunday morning, you, you missed the basis of the message. So, amen. So, prayer request. Yes, Miss Kathy. Amen. We love you, Kathy. 
I love you all the time. Yes, sir. She got any room in her suitcase, the one that's going to Hawaii? She got any room in her suitcase, the one going to Hawaii? Really? Well, Deb wants to go. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Can you give me a first name? Ethel. I thought somebody texted me a prayer request. <laughs> Make sure to turn that off. Who else? Yes, Miss Becky. Oh, it's Kayla, right? Okay, I'm not sure I got that right. Who else? Awesome. Anyone else? It reminds me of Haiti, to be honest with you. It is it is hot. It is hot. Um I'm going to share a very, very personal praise with you um, for me. Um, I have three half-sisters and a half-brother. I did not grow up with them in the same household. Some of you may know that. Of course, my wife knows that. Um, and we grew up on different sides of the tracks. Let's just put it that way. I'll put that lightly. And... Um, <clears throat> lost touch after my mom and dad um, passed away. Um, and, of course, we're, I guess you could say we all come from the same mother. But it's a praise. Uh, I'm f finally, I guess they finally are reaching out to me. So after 15 years, uh, my sister Cheryl has been reaching out and talking and praying um, together. So that's a praise. And then my brother, who just reached out to me uh, last week after 17 years, um, reached out to me after he found out. And guys, I'm not going to bore you with the background story behind that, but we just praise God that um, I guess they are not, they're like shocked at their uh, hoodlum little younger brother from back in Washington, D.C. is now a pastor, and that was one of the things that kind of just threw them for a loop. Um, I say this to you because you probably know it's true. Those closest to you will persecute you first. Amen? And so just pray for them, you know? So I just, I praise God because uh, it's nice to be able to talk to them as a changed man by Jesus Christ alone. So, um, I'll tell you what, God's got a sense of humor. Amen, guys? Any other prayer requests and praise reports? Yes, sir.
Amen. Definitely be in prayer for you. All right. Well, if there's no more prayer requests or praise reports, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, look forward to Brother Dakota coming and sharing with us what God has laid on his heart. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity as brothers and sisters to come before you tonight, Father Lord, before your throne. Lord, as we are lifting each other up, uh, Lord, we thank you. Um, We don't deserve you, but you chose us anyway. It's nice to know, Father Lord, that you are with us each and every time we take a breath, each beat of our heart. It's because of you. And Father, we should not take that lightly, Lord, but just praise you for the life that you have given us, Father. Lord, we lift up Katie Sandoval, Lord, as she is currently sick with a 101-degree fever. Um, Lord, as Sister Kathy brought that up, we just thank you, Lord, that, um, <clears throat> you know, Katie um, is a part of this. You touch her, Father, and help her just to get through this time of COVID. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for Sister Kathy. Uh, Lord, she praises you for all the wonderful people that she has surrounding her, Father, Lord, that you have gifted her with. And, Lord, we thank you for that as well as we, again, bear one another burdens and just love on one another. Lord, we pray for Don's uh, granddaughter who's in Africa, Lord, and uh, hearing the jungle sounds, warthogs, monkeys, and coming in 20 feet of them, Lord. I just pray for, uh, Lord, for just safety for her, Lord, as she's there. But, Lord, that you allow her to experience something that forever affects her life, Lord. And so we just thank you for that, Lord, for what she's doing. I also pray for her traveling mercies as her um, daughter will be flying out to Hawaii, Father, Lord, that you just <clears throat> give that a, a peaceful and, and fruitful trip, Lord, as a, of, of a time of rest. Lord, we pray for the... Sister uh, Ethel, who has stomach cancer, Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that you touch her, Lord. And uh, Father, there just seems to be so much cancer going around. We thank you, Lord, for the treatments that we do have, and we just pray for her, Lord. <clears throat> Becky lifts up to her daughter Taylor and um, her son-in-law as um, they both have COVID. Uh, Lord, I pray that you just, um, gosh, Lord, touch them, Lord, as they seem to be doing a little better. We pray, Father, Lord, to give them full recovery. Uh, Lord, we pray for our daughter-in-law, Kayla, Lord, who's fighting kidney stones. And, Lord, I pray that you give her comfort, Lord, and that she's able to, to um, pull through this with more comfort than discomfort, Lord. Of course, pray for her sweet daddy, Carl, Lord, and just keep him in your care, Father, Lord, as uh, he is a senior saint, Father, Lord. We just thank you for him. Lord, we thank you for the ladies who were able to come out and help at the clothing closet. Thank you for that, Lord, as they were able to serve you and get much done. Father, uh, be about your work. We thank you, Lord, for those ministries. They're so vitally important. Father, we pray for Brother Brian, Lord, as he's working in this heat at a ballpark uh, this evening, Father. Lord, we pray for the other workers. Even pray for the people who are in the stands watching the game. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Just keep Brian, Lord, well hydrated, Father, and safe. And, Lord, I want to pray for Brother Dakota in two ways, Lord. First, I want to ask you, Lord, for protection as he, too, works in the warehouse. Uh, Father, where it's extremely hot, no air conditioning, Father, Lord, that you uh, cover him with your grace and mercy. And, Lord, continue to give him uh, what he needs to pursue through. But most of all, Father, I thank you for the growth that I've been able to watch, Father Lord, uh, in this young man. Uh, Father, as you continue to hide him behind your cross, but Lord, as you also put the, your words on his tongue, Father, I pray that you anoint him, this Father, tonight, that he can speak to us so we can hear from you. So, Father Lord, I pray that you bless him in this way. Lord, continue to gird up his loins. And Father, Lord, make him a fire plug for the gospel. We pray these things in your most blessed name. And all God's people said, amen. Good evening, everybody. 
you could go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 25. As you're turning there, I want to go ahead and, and just go ahead and start off by thanking the Lord. First for this opportunity, but also uh, uh, for Pastor Dave. Uh, about two hours before we all got here today, I was sitting in my office, and I was thinking uh, and reaching out to people. I was thinking that Dave would still be in Ohio, and he wouldn't be here tonight. So I was reaching out to other people to help with worship or to help with the prayer and praises. And everybody was like, sorry, we're out of town. Sorry, we won't be there tonight. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have the man up. I'm going to have to do praise. I'm going to have to do prayer. I'm going to have to preach. I said, let's do it. And then Dave walks in, and then, oh, everything just melted away, and it was great. So uh, I'm thankful for uh, Pastor Dave, and I'm thankful for uh, his ministry and what he does. But uh, I'm looking forward to tonight and the word that God has for us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just open us up with a, a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the words, Lord, your word, your most holy and most sacred word. Lord, as it is important, as it is all powerful and mighty, Lord, it is your word that can melt a heart of stone. So, Lord, I ask that you be with us, that we are encouraged and lifted up, Lord, as your children, as we hear your word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 25, and we're going to start in verse 1. Jesse asked me to do 22 verses. It's a lot, so I'm going to sort of break it up into segments as we go. Uh, so I'm going to read, uh, starting in verse 1, it reads, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, Spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. Onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture so you shall make it. May God bless the reading of his word. First, we see here in Exodus that God is provider. We see that all things that the Israelites have, the Lord has provided. And so the Lord has asked his people to be cheerful givers, to give willingly. This is not a tax passed down from God to his people. He's not demanding that they give. He's asking that they give. For whoever shall feel moved within their hearts that they should give. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, each one must give us or give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We see in verse 2, when we give to the Lord, we must do so from a heart of willingness and worship. We, might, we must not be coerced or even begrudgingly give to the Lord. Yet, we are still to give and to give with a heart of worship. You see, everything that we have belongs to the Lord. The act of freely giving is more beautiful than any treasure that we can store here on earth. Right? And so, in verse 3, we see that not only are we asked to give, but we are told exactly what to give. We see that we're not just supposed to give willy-nilly, right? <laughs> we just don't give sporadically. We don't give here or there. We are told what to give with our offerings and our tithes. And you can't just say, well, Lord, I gave my time to the church this past week, so I'm going to skip on tithes this Sunday, right? That's not what we are meant to do. And it's crazy because there are so many church attenders and as I was talking with Pastor Robert, he said, Dakota, be careful, you're going to sip on so many toes tonight. I said, well, I hope I do, right? 
There are so many people who are more willing to hold to their subscriptions on Netflix or Hulu or internet or cable more than they're more willing to give back to God. And that's where we're failing. Is that more, more, we are more worried about our comfortability than we are about praising and worshiping God. The God who gave us what we have. The house that I have, the money that sits in my bank account is all because of the Lord. It's nothing that I have done. And what I find interesting is the Israelites are out in the wilderness. How did they come about this wealth? Now don't look at your notes real quick. Everybody stay up here. I want to see if you guys, you might have looked ahead and you might already know, but I want to see if you guys know how they got their wealth. There's three ways. Yes, Brother Don. Right? Uh, the God, God told them as they leave, ask the Egyptians to give you gold and silver and bronze and everything else. And so that's what they did. They asked and the Egyptians gave just like God had told them. Now there are two other ways that I, I see in Scripture. Yes, sir. Brother. Yeah, go ahead. Amen. Yeah. So. <laughs> War would have been Miss Debbie's answer. <laughs> we also see in Genesis chapter 47 and verse 11. So there are many different places to look at this. But we see that because of Joseph, this is how the Israelites came to Egypt was through Joseph. His people were brought into the land of Egypt, out of the land of Canaan, where the famine had struck. And if you don't remember, Joseph was sold into slavery to the Egyptians by his brothers. And we see that he was a prisoner. And then he began interpreting dreams, and then interpreted the dream of the Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh gave him a place in his hierarchy. And then when the famines came, his family came forward. Joseph's family came. And so we need food. So he provided food, and he provided a lot more than that. He gave them land in Egypt. And I can only surmise that Joseph had wealth for working with Pharaoh, working for Pharaoh. And so I, I can only believe that the Israelites inherited some wealth as they were slaves to Egypt. And I'm sure they probably hid it. From the Egyptians once the change of the king came. And so that's one place that I see that. And then as Brother Don pointed out in Exodus chapter 12 verses 35 through 36, we see that they gained more wealth through plundering <coughs> excuse me, Egypt. We see that as they are leaving, as God is bringing them out from slavery, that they are given even more wealth. In Exodus chapter 17 verses 8 through 13, we see that they are that Amalekites are given into the hands of the Israelites, just as Pastor Dave was talking about, or as eloquently as Ms. Debbie says, through war, right? When there is war, there are spoils to be had. So I can only surmise that they gained wealth. Is that in each and every one of those scenarios, how did they gain that wealth? It wasn't by what they did. It's by what God did. It's what God had provided for the Israelites. Through Joseph, through the Exodus, and through winning the wars. And, you know, I find it ironic that at the same time that Moses is getting this instruction from the Lord on top of the mountain, that at the same time down at the foot of the mountain, the Israelites are already gathering their gold and bronze together but they're not coming to build the tabernacle or the ark. They're coming forth to build a false idol. They're already one step ahead. They're just one step ahead in the wrong direction. And so we see that God is righteously angry with that. And so I just find that amusing 
that God is sitting here telling Moses, gather all of these things so it can build the tabernacle, so it can build the Ark of the Covenant to worship me. And yet the people were already forgotten the God who has fed them, who has led them through the wilderness, who has helped them escape from Egypt. They are already building. It says that Moses was on the, only on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. That's like a month and a half. All right, Hank is about to turn three months in about six days. That's like if I would already forget Hank and go somewhere else, right? That's pretty quick to me, all right? I know, um, you know, a little side story, uh, kind of funny. When me and Holly were engaged, there were several times where I would enjoy dinner at her family's house, and she would say, okay, Dakota, it's time for you to leave and go back to Grammy's house, because at the time I, I lived with my grandmother, okay? About three weeks after our honeymoon, I'm sitting on the couch in our house with Holly, and she, and it's about 8 o'clock, and Holly goes, try to trick me and, and, and make me think that I was out when I wasn't supposed to be. She thought that I would forget, and honestly, for a split second, I was like, oh, you're right, dear, let me go out. <laughs> so she got me. <laughs> but uh, just, just the funny story of how quick we are to forget, because that was only three weeks for myself, and I had already forgotten that. But we see through verses 3 and 7, it, it, it lists out the things that they are to contribute for God's construction. We see it starts with gold. It starts with the most pricey, the most uh, material. Gold to silver to bronze. And then the blue and purple and scarlet yarns. The fine twined linen, the goat's hair, the tanned ram skin, the goat skins, the acacia wood. Right? It's almost like he is putting in descending order of not only importance but worth. And we see that we are able to give, even if it's not gold, we can still give yarn. We can still give the goat skin, right? And so even the small things God can use. With the array of materials and size and in worth that God is listing out, he's asking for them to give. That's sort of like us, right? When we come to church and it's time for tithes and offering, right? Uh, I'm strapped for cash this week. I really don't want to give. Even if you give a dollar, give that dollar with joy and thankfulness. Give that dollar with praise to a God who has given you that dollar. And then when you're on top of the mountain... And you feel like you can go out and buy a Lamborghini, which I hope you don't spoil God's money that way. Give even more to the church. And don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and lecture you about offering and tithes. I'm moving on, so you don't have to worry about that. But secondly, we see in verses 8 through 9 that God is with us. Not only did God ask for his people to give freely, He asked them to do so, so he could dwell among them. And we know that this is a hard task to accomplish. To follow God's instructions perfectly. We can't even follow ten rules, ten laws, ten commandments. Let alone follow this extravagant blueprint of how to fill out the tabernacle. But you see, they did it with the help of God just as we can do all things through Christ. God wanted to tabernacle among his people. And this is not the only time in history that this has happened. We see all the way in Genesis, at the Garden of Eden. We see when Adam and Eve sin, they hide. And it says that the Lord walked among them. We see that the Lord was with them. The Lord was dwelling with them. We see that God tabernacled with Adam and Eve. God wants to be with his people, but it's his people that turn him away. And so we see that this exodus, this exodus out of Egypt, was used to begin the bridging of the gap between man and God. 
Because God wishes to have a divine human relationship with us. And we see later that he continues to do so. We see later that the word became flesh and Jesus dwelled among us. We see in John chapter 1 verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He dwelled among us in his fully human and fully God form. And then we see after the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, once he no longer dwells with us in human form, we see that God then sends us the Holy Spirit. First as a guarantee and also as a promise. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 reads, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. See, God wants to be with us. God wants to love us. But it's his people who turn him away. It's his children that turn away from him. And it's crazy because there are a lot of people that I've come across who believe that God created us and then just left. And said, oh, you guys can figure it out on your own. I'm going to go over here. Right? When I was a security guard, and some of you may have heard the story already. I'm only 24, so I don't have a lot of stories yet, so I apologize for <laughs> repeats. Right? But uh, when I was a security guard, I was a manager, and I had to train several uh, people who came in wanting to be security guards. And at the time, thankfully this was during my day shift, uh, I had a Jehovah Witness sitting in the car with me. And we got to talking, and because I love being able to work here at the church part-time uh, for myself, because I can use that as a segue in my secular job to be like, hey, I have another job outside of this. They're like, oh, what is it? I'm like, well, I work for the church. And they're like, oh, okay. Right? <laughs> they t tend to walk away. But thankfully, this guy was very eager to talk. And he told me that God created the world, he created all its inhabitants, the birds and the animals, and then he left. And he gave kingship to the devil. I said, brother, if that were true, we'd be dead already. I said, if the devil was in control, we would already be in hell. I said, God is still with us. There is hope and peace and joy to be had in this world. It may look like hell is all around us, <laughs> but it's not. We have a holy God who is with us and who loves us. And we see continuing in verse 9. It talks about uh, um, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture so you shall make it. So we see that God is talking about a pattern. And what is this pattern that we're talking about? Well, the writer of Hebrews said in, in chapter 8, verse 5, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. The shadow of the heavenly things. The tabernacle to future things, to heavenly things. And we can see that God is pointing Moses to a shadow of things to come, a shadow of Christ. But in order to fully understand the ministry of Christ, we must understand the shadow and type that was given to us through the construction of the tabernacle. We see this starting in verse 10. I'm going to read. Starting in verse 10, it says, They shall make an ark of acacia wood, Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and outside you shall overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. 
You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put on them its four feet, two rings on the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. So to break down the verse 16. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. What does he mean by the testimony? The Ten Commandments, Commandments. correct. Awesome. So it was the Ten Commandments that the hand of God had written on two tablets for Moses. That he was instructed to put inside of the ark of the covenant. And as it stands... It was as a symbol. It was a shadow of things to come. It symbolized the graciousness of the law. The world looks to the law of God as the absolute opposite of grace. However, it is more unloving to allow your brother or sister to continue sinning than it is to say something about their sin. See, you are coming with grace and mercy and love to your brother or sister who is practicing sin. Sin is lawlessness, right? You are practicing love when you point that sin out to your brother or sister. You are not practicing sin when you allow them to continue practicing in that sin. So we are to show mercy and grace in that. And we see That the law, as it abounds in grace, it reminds us of our relationship with the Lord and our relationships with one another as human creation. We see that the ark is laid with gold. I don't know how many of you have seen pure gold, but it is a pretty beautiful sight to behold. Especially uh, a, a two foot by three foot chest that is overlaid with gold and the masterwork that was put into it, right? Grace is a beautiful thing, just as beautiful as this gold was. It also symbolizes the immorality of the law. The law continues to press on. No matter what may happen to the tablets, to the Bible, it will be ingrained into the very essence of our hearts and soul, right? We see, we don't practice legalism, right? We don't practice that we earn salvation through our works. But because of our faith, because of our salvation, we can follow these things. We see in verse 13 that it talks about the acacia wood. Not only was this wood the only wood in the wilderness for them to use, It was also the strongest, most durable, and incorruptible wood that they could have used for the construction of the ark, much like the law of God. The law of God is incorruptible. It is unchangeable. It is immutable. It also symbolizes the supremacy of the law. The law is sovereign. The law of God is the moral compass in which the world runs, whether they wish to acknowledge it or not. You talk to somebody, and they'll tell you that killing someone is wrong. Well, how do you know that? Well, I just know in my heart that that it's wrong. I shouldn't kill that person. Well, that's the law of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and as it stands, I don't have a direct answer, but from my studies, I can gather that when the Lord showed 
Moses how to construct the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and every other furniture in the tabernacle, I would put it that he had it to memory. That something so glorious as heavenly things would be ingrained into his mind. And no, he doesn't have paper and pen for him to exactly draw it out. No, I, I, uh, I'm thankful for the question because, yeah. I like how your mind works, Don. That's just not how mine worked. Uh, when I started studying for Exodus 25, I went deep. I mean, I always go into these rabbit holes of like, how are we here, right? So that's, that's why at the beginning I, I went through the lineage of Joseph and, you know, worked through that. But that is a great question, and I will look into that in the future. <laughs> but the, the, the law is supreme. The law is sovereign. And we see in verse 11, it says to put a molding around the top of the ark. This also can be translated to crown, right? That's why we have crown moldings, right? God told him to put a crown on top. A crown set atop of the ark signifying the supremacy of the law, signifying the kingship, right? And also, it symbolizes the holiness of the law. In verse 15, we see that poles made of acacia wood were added to the ark to lift the ark, to keep people from touching the ark. We see that the ark was so holy that we were not to touch it. And we see later on what happens when you touch it, you're struck dead. We see that our is like filthy rags in the presence of God. So the priest were the ones who carried the ark. And it says that the the poles should not be taken from the ark, right? Just as we are to never abandon the word of God. Don't let it leave your gaze. As Pastor Avery and Pastor Jesse and, and Pastor Dave have been talking about in the past couple Sundays, right? We are to rest in the word of God. We are not to fall away from it. For the word of God is holy, it is unchanging, it is faultless and blameless, and it is pure and sublime. Right? The word of God is a beautiful thing. But you see, all of these were symbols. All of these were a shadow of one even greater. Christ is the greater ark 
of an everlasting covenant. Christ is full of grace, giving his life so that you may come to him freely. Christ is immortal. He is incorruptible. As he was tempted to try just as we were and are, yet he prevailed. He is reigning and will reign forevermore. For he is ruler of all. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Christ is holy. And because of all of these attributes, because he unites himself being fully God and fully human, he's able to not abolish the law. He's able to fulfill the law for us and on our behalf. We're going to continue in verse 12, uh, excuse me, 17 in Exodus 25. It reads, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them. On the two ends of the mercy seat, make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece, excuse me, of one seat, nope, I got small print, excuse me. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you and commandment for the people of Israel. So there's a lot. And one thing that sticks out to me, right, Brother Don pointed out, how did they hammer the cherubim, right? That's not where my mind went, though that is a great point. My mind went to, when is the last time that we saw cherubim, right? When is the last time that we saw God set in place cherubim? Do any of you know? Yes. Correct, right? So God cast out Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and he placed a cherubim at the entrance with a flaming sword, guarding it from further entrance. And we see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, I'll read it. It says, he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. We see that when this cherubim was placed, he was placed facing out from the tree of life to protect people from coming in. But we see in verse 20, it says, The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Now we see they're not facing out. We see that they're facing in to one another. No longer are they protecting, right? That is what they are placed for. That's what they are set for, for protection. No longer are they protecting from outside sources. They are now protecting the outside from an inside source. And that is God. Because we know, just as he spoke to Moses pertaining to hiding his face from the glory of God, if one man was to look upon the glory of God, he would be obliterated, right? Not just struck dead, but he would be obliterated. And so the cherubim were set to protect the people. And we see that that even isn't enough to protect the people. We see later in the Day of Atonement that they had to set incense, a cloud of smoke around the mercy seat so that the priest could go in and atone for the sins of himself and of the people. And so what exactly was this, I'm going to turn to Leviticus chapter 16. You're more than welcome to join me there if you would like. But the chapter 16 talks about the ritual, the, the festival of the Day of Atonement. 
I'm going to read starting in verse 15. Leviticus chapter 16, starting in verse 15. It says, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins, and so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanliness. We see that the mercy seat was where the payment was placed to atone, to cover our sins. Blood is needed to atone for the sins of people. We see in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. That is our debt. That is our debt to God as sinners born into the curse of sin, right? The only way to obtain salvation, to obtain everlasting life, is through that debt being paid. And that debt was paid by Christ. And we see that the mercy seat was placed on top of the chest. We see that it covers the testimony given by God, the Ten Commandments. So we see that the mercy seat sits between the law and between God. He placed it there as a covering for our sin. That he would remember our sins No more. For we see that for the Israelites, they had the ark. They had the mercy seat in which they had to sprinkle the blood of the bull and of the goat to atone for the sins of the people. But we see that we, we have a greater mercy seat. That is Christ Jesus, our Lord. The one who displayed his love to us through his death that redeemed his people and made them righteous before God. It is because of Christ standing in the gap, being the ultimate mediator, that our sins can be covered. The bloodshed of Christ wasn't for naught. There was power and meaning behind the shedding of Christ's blood. It was a propitiation for our sins. It was the payment It was the once and for all debt clearer of our sins. As far as the east is from the west, the Lord has forgiven us of our sins. The stain of sin is no more. Praise be to God for the mercy seat that covers us in Christ Jesus. And it's because of Christ that we can freely go to God. We no longer need the veil. We no longer need the altar. We no longer need priests to go to God. We can freely go to God. I want to close with a reminder that all things are given by God. All things are God's. Our lives is for God. Our children are the Lord's. Our grandchildren are are for the Lord. All things belong to God, the one who provides all things. Be encouraged that God is with us, and he will never leave or desert you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what trials, tribulations, heartache, sadness, depression, God is with you. He wants to be with you, right? It's not like, He looks down and goes, well, Dakota's having a bad day, so I'm just going to step to the side and and let him sort of figure that out. God is with us. He wants to be with us. And it is because of Christ that we, as followers of God, that we can go to God. Christ has brought us into the new covenant, the covenant of grace. Because, lastly, Christ is our greater mercy seat. Because of his death on the cross, we no longer need a priest. We no longer need pastors. 
You don't have to go to Pastor Jesse, Pastor Dave, Pastor Avery, and ask for prayer. You can pray right where you are. We can freely pray because we don't need this altar to pray. But in an act of worship, in an act of obedience, in an act of love for God who provided all things is why we do all things. Praise be to God and his loving kindness. For without him, we would not be here tonight. For without him, I wouldn't be able to stand here before you proclaiming the name of Christ. Because the Lord knows I need it. Here as of late, my feet have been killing me. I feel like metal rods are going through my heels. As of right now, I just want to sit, (laughs) right? But by the mercy of God, I can stand here before you. By the mercy of God, you can sit here and listen to the instruction of God that you heard God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this time of study, of diving into your word. Lord, understanding all things through your scriptures. Lord, it is only by you and you alone that we have our very breath. That we can bow our heads and close our eyes and pray to you. Lord, so I thank you and I praise you for your love, for your mercy, that you saved a wretched sinner like me like us, your people, your church, Lord, to serve you and to worship you. So, Lord, as we go outside these walls tonight, may we continue to be encouraged and uplifted by you as we are constantly reminded of who we serve and why we serve. So, Lord, be with us. Lead us and guide us. In your most holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.